Our Father in heaven, bless us as we talk about the writings of Paul. I ask for your spirit in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. We're just going to finish that up quickly. Then we'll move to Romans. Galatians chapter 5. I was in Germany one time. I was going to visit a church I'd never been to it before. And as I was walking up the steps, a man stopped me. He said, Do you know about Romans? Uh, Excuse me, about Galatians 5 2. I had memorized the book of Galatians. But I didn't have in my head what was in 5 2. I didn't know what that verse was without looking at it. He asked me if I was circumcised. <laughs> That's private information. It's none of his business. But he showed me the verse. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. So he was telling people, if you're circumcised, you won't go to heaven. So I tried to explain to him that's not what the verse means. What the verse really means is that circumcision doesn't help you go to heaven. It doesn't matter one way or the other. But after I was done speaking there, I talked to the leaders of the church. And I told them they need to do something about that man. Because if he's going to talk to visitors like that, they're never going to come back. <coughs> so, so he needs to be removed somehow. You might have people like that in churches that you attend. When I was in Malaysia, we had a lady in the church from the Philippines. She's very kind, but she doesn't know when to be quiet. And she says awkward things to, to strangers. Like if a Buddhist visits church, she might ask, why don't you become a Christian? Don't you know Buddha is just an idol? It, it's true what she says, but it's not a good method. You understand what I'm saying? So we were going to have a series of meetings for the public. And we want to give a job to every church member. So I'm thinking, what job to give to her? And I had an idea. Let's have her be part of a prayer group. They won't meet inside the building. They can meet anywhere, even back at their house. And they can pray for us. I felt pretty good about this idea. So we started the meeting. But not many people came in. And after a couple nights, I walked out to see if I could figure out what's wrong. 
And I saw the lady. If this is the walkway to the building. She's standing right beside it. And she's praying that God will convert everybody. She's praying out loud. So people have to walk by her to get in. And of course, they're not going to walk in after that. But I'm trying to say to you, you need to be aware of what's going on. Because Satan will try to use people to stop God's work. Look at verse 7. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion doesn't come from the one that calls you. So it's possible when you practice Christianity that some persuasive person could lead you backwards. That someone who's very good at persuading people could lead you backwards. There are false teachers. <coughs> and some of them are quite good at teaching. Verse 9. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. <clears throat> now, in your church, it could be a different type of false teacher. But, but in this case, we know what the false teachers were teaching. Because we studied it already in, first, in Acts 15. They were saying you must be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. Or else you can't be saved. Verse 10. He says, I have confidence in you and the Lord that you will be no otherwise minded. But he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. <laughs> So what did Paul mean about bear his judgment? Look at verse 12. I could wish that those who trouble you would even be cut off themselves. Does yours say cut themselves off or be cut off? Yeah, so the Greek can go either way. But what he's saying, he wishes that they would leave the church. He wishes they wouldn't be part of the church anymore. And uh, there are people like that that you will meet in church today. We wish they would leave, but we might have to help them. Look at verse 14. <clears throat> For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There are two aspects of the law. Love to God and love to man. <clears throat> Which aspect is he summarizing here? <laughs> That's the love to man. And why is he emphasizing that one? Because he's talking about how we get along in the church. So that's about the relationship of people. Verse 15. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. 
কিন্তু তোমরা যদি পরস্পর দংশন ও গ্রাস করো তবে দেখিও যেন পরস্পরের দ্বারা ধ্বংসপ্রাপ্ত না হও Of course that's a metaphor অবশ্যই এটা একটা দৃষ্টান্ত But this is the metaphor he uses for when people are fighting and arguing with their words. Now look at verse 16. I say, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So, there are two ways. You follow the spirit working through your conscience. So you don't indulge yourself. Or you follow your desires and you indulge yourself. This is why God has made health part of the religious teachings of the church. Because people need to learn how to deny themselves. Look down at verse 19. Have you heard of this phrase, the fruit of the Spirit? So this is the chapter where you find it. But before Paul tells us what the fruit of having the Spirit is like, he tells us what the fruit of not having the Spirit is like. So if you have both lists, you can figure out pretty good whether you have the Spirit or not. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are visible, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. Those first four are all related to sexual activity. Then verse 20, idolatry, that's worshiping idols, sorcery, so a Christian shouldn't go to the witch doctor to learn something or for, or for sickness. Hatred. This is the third one in verse 20. Is it similar in yours? What does it say in yours? Different type of... Enemy. Enmities. Enmity is pretty close to hatred. Yeah, it's about the same idea. So, if you wish that someone would die, or you're happy when they suffer, that's a fruit of the flesh. Then the next one means like arguments. People like to argue. That's the normal way for someone who's not filled with the Spirit. Uh, then it says jealousies. If it makes you, if you're bothered when someone else is loved or respected or does well, that's a fruit of the flesh. The next one is outbursts. Like when you get so angry, you, you say something. <coughs> or when you're seeking for yourself uh, selfish ambitions. Now what does the last one in verse 20 say in yours? The last one. Is it like false teachings? What does it mean in English? Huh? Separation. Separation. Okay, that's not a bad translation. So the last one in this one <coughs> talks about those who cause uh, splits in the church. 
those who are separating the brothers into groups over their various beliefs. In verse 21, you have things that are more obvious. Like murder and being drunk and going to parties. So those are things that show you that you have not been filled with the Spirit. And what about the evidence that you have been filled? That's verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Sometimes people say things about these two verses that aren't really accurate. They say the word fruit is singular. So the fruit of the Spirit is just love. And the rest of those just explain what love is. But that's not right. That fruit is one of those interesting nouns, both in English and Greek, that can be singular and plural at the same time. <clears throat> in English, if I say buy some fruit, it means the same thing as if I say buy some fruits. And it's the same in Greek. And it's the same with the word seed. I can say we need to get some seed. Or we need to get some seeds. It means the same thing. And uh, so the fruit of the Spirit is all of those things. Any questions about that? In uh, yours, does it show the word fruit in a plural or singular way, or does it even matter in yours? Okay. Yeah. And uh, is it the same way in Bangla that you can say, get some fruit, and you use a singular form? Or you... Yeah. That's why you don't need to explain. Okay, very good. All right, so <coughs> chapter 6. <coughs> 6 verse 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. What does that mean? So, let's say that you're a student here, and you, and you catch one of the your classmates looking at some pornography on his phone. There are several ways you can handle that. You could just forget about it. That's his life. You could say something loud. Hey, Eugene's using pornography. That way he'll never do it again. <laughs> you can do that. Uh, are either of those a good idea? What does verse 1 say? It says you need to confront him. But before you do it, examine yourself. Make sure that you're not acting proudly. Because the devil could tempt you to be harsh while you're trying to help someone who's making a mistake. And what, what is your goal? The verse says it's to restore them. That it's almost like putting a, a, a shoulder back in the joint. 
Your, your goal isn't to uh, say, shame on you and cut it off. <laughs> so this is a nice illustration for you. What's natural is to do one of the first two things. It's natural to do nothing. Because that's easiest. Or it's natural to gossip. I saw him using pornography. Watch out for that guy. He uses pornography. You don't want to date him. If I say that, I'm not really trying to protect you. I just have this, this information in me and I want to share it with somebody. And I have a good excuse to say that to you. But these are wrong ones. But who do you talk to in verse 1? The one who made the mistake. Any questions about that? Do you like that verse? I don't like it. It's not a short one. It would be a great one for your one of your two verses in Galatians. Look at verse 5. This is kind of a theme of this part of the book. So we're a small family here. It could be that someone's going to hurt your feelings tomorrow. They might even hurt your feelings every day for three days in a row. And if that happens, and you decide to leave, and you go home and you get drunk, and someone asks you, whose fault is it that you're drunk? You might think, it's that man that hurt my feelings. But verse 5 says, no, that's not right. It's his fault for being unkind. He's responsible for what he did. And you're responsible for what you did. You're not responsible for what he did. And he's not responsible for what you did. Let me explain how that can be used the wrong way. I mean, how people misabuse this idea. So imagine, Melissa, that you're dating a guy four years from now. He seems pretty good. But after a few months, you realize he's not the one. So you sit him down. I hope God finds a good lady for you. But it's not me. And you tell him. And he begins to cry. He says, if you won't marry, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> that sounds like me, yeah. Is that Romania mm -hmm. you said? That sounds like me. That I would do that. Oh, you would do that. So, if someone says that to you, mm -hmm. you probably shouldn't say, if that's what you have to do, do it. <laughs> In my mind, I would. But, but what you need to say is that I'm doing what I think is right. That's my responsibility. You should do what you believe is right. That's your responsibility. You know better than to kill yourself. And if he goes and kills himself, is it your fault? 
Verse 5 says it's not. Verse 5 says we all bear our own responsibility. That everyone bear his own responsibility. So this is good for you to know. Because otherwise you become very much like a spiritual baby. You're blaming everyone for the decisions you make. I yelled at her because she said that. No. Okay. She's guilty for saying it and you're guilty for yelling. You understand. But this isn't the end of the story. Look back at verse 2. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You know, if these two verses, verse 2 and 5, were in different books, people would say it's a contradiction. But since they're so close together, people don't say it. And they're not a contradiction. What does it mean? It means that even though it's your responsibility what you do, it's my responsibility to treat you the right way. I can be helpful to you. If I find a man who got drunk and fell beside the road last night, if I show him some compassion, and I try to help him out, and he just keeps on drinking in the future, still I should be, I should care about him. We owe it to each other to care for each other. When I say we owe it, that's in verse 2. It says fulfill the law of Christ. So we're moving now to Romans, but I want you to look at Romans 13 for a minute. Mm -hmm. Because Romans 13 is the same idea. Romans 13, we're going to look at verse 8. Romans 13, verse 8. It says, Owe no man anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Do you see it's the same idea we saw in Galatians 6? It's the same idea. It says that loving your neighbor is fulfilling the law. Verse 9. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet, and if any other's commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So he takes uh, the last six commandments. And those are the ones about loving your neighbor. And he says you can summarize these as love your neighbor as yourself. You might say, why doesn't he mention about idolatry or taking God's name in vain? 
And that's because in this chapter he's talking about the authority of government. He says, we're, he says we're obligated to obey the government. But what kind of authority does the government have? Only authority to enforce the last six commandments. That is, the government can make rules about what man owes to man. But the government can't make rules about what man owes to God. Jonas, we have a contingent of nice people coming to visit us. Would you go talk to them for a minute and see what that's about? Thank you. So now let's go back to the first part of Romans. Look to Romans 1. Romans 1 has a famous passage about the gospel. Look at verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew and also to the Greek. Uh, do you see in verse 16 that the gospel has power? And who, where does the power work? In what situation does it work? It's only in those that believe. So Jesus said to one city, or he said about the city, he couldn't do much there because of their unbelief. Uh, if you meet someone and they're trying to uh, overcome their anger issues, <laughs> but they say I can't do it the gospel says to them all things are possible to the one that believes it's your love and trust for God that opens a way for him to work inside of you any questions about that idea did you ever think of the gospel as power before? It's not just facts. Go ahead, Tony. You can ask about the previous. So, now the government is making statue of the Bongo Bundu and also we have like some statues that represents our uh, victory. So every every year, at least three to four times, it is mandatory for everyone to go and give flower memory to them. Just as statues and all. Like to lay a flower there. Yes. Mm -hmm. So is it, it Aren't we breaking rules? Are we breaking? Yeah. Have you done it before? Yeah. I did also. Those not a statue, statue, but there's a, like it's a symbol thing, and you have to give flowers like in the for the honor of the marchers. And then and then there is like one more. Place where we went. 
they have uh, Bongo Bondo's grave. And uh, those people who go there, they should. Like, if you don't give, they'll be looking at you like, what's wrong with you? Okay. So, sometimes when I'm walking on this road, I pick a flower and give it to my wife. I'm not worshipping her. She's not my idol. But I appreciate her. I love her. And I show that by the flower. If she were to die today, and was to be buried, I might put a flower on her tomb. Not because she became my idol. I'm not praying to her. I'm not worshipping her. But I love her and I miss her. The Bible doesn't condemn this kind of idea. So I have a picture here of the hero of the nation. If I'm praying to him, that's idolatry. If I'm asking him to bless me, that's idolatry. If I think I'm going to get good luck because I put the flower there, that's idolatry or superstition. But if, I just, but, I just, but if I just want to show my appreciation, the Bible doesn't condemn that. But as soon as you have a rule that requires it, it becomes much less meaningful. If there is no rule, when you put the flower there, you mean it. But when there is a rule, you might just mean, I don't want to get in trouble. Yeah, did I answer your question? Yeah, let's take this first. He didn't understand. Uh, Galatians 6 6. Oh, we didn't read it, but let's go back to it. Galatians 6 verse 6. Yeah, this is one of the hardest verses in the whole book. It's not hard because it's a difficult idea. It's just hard because it could mean two different things. But it looks like that the most likely answer is that the one who is taught in the word refers to all Christians. And that we should be seeking to learn from our Father in Heaven who teaches us all. But it really isn't clear which way it should be understood. So I probably can't help you with it. But if you look at verse 7, you'll see that what God is looking for is that you think long term. The things you do today have long-term effects. So if you study hard today, that will have a good effect. You'll reap that later on. If God teaches you today, then there will be a good effect later on. But if you're indulging yourself today, that leads to a different type of reaping. Anyway, I can't really help you with verse 6. But I'm glad that verse 5 and 7 are easy to understand. 
Is there any other question? Yes, yeah, go ahead. So is it okay? Like I know that it's not okay. Uh, my in a, in Baptist Baptist many people they uh, they say like this uh, if I get this thing done then I will give this thing to God. Or I understand. Is it right? So let me say it and you translate it. Okay. Some people make promises. If God does such and such, I will do such and such. Uh, you find promises like that in the Bible. Uh, sometimes when you look at them, you realize they weren't very smart. So the first one is Jephthah. The first one is Jephthah from the book of Judges. He promised God if you make me victorious then the first thing that greets me when I come home I'll sacrifice it. He probably had lots of animals and expected one of them to come. But what was the first thing to greet him? It was his daughter. So it makes one of the sad stories of the Bible. So I, I wouldn't say that it's wrong to make a promise like that. But there is a way where it would be wrong. <coughs> if you make it as if God owes you the results. You say, I'll be a Christian if you help me marry this person. Uh, you mean you're not going to do what you should do unless God gives you what you, what you ask for? So God won't cooperate with that. Yeah, God won't participate in that deal. Is there any other questions? I like questions. What about that washing grave and then thinking about, yeah, like some people they go to the grave and then they put candles. Specific, not specific, like yes. like uh, during the Christmas, most of the Baptist people, they, they would, uh, not uh, only Baptist, uh, like many, uh, they would go to the grave. It's a Christian thing. They go to the grave and they put, they put candles and then they, you know, like, give the flower petals, decorate them, and then clean the graveyard. Last time it happened. We were in Chatpur in Kumila, <coughs> uh, me and him and the other two, and then they asked us to help them. And then we <coughs> said no. So we also went and we helped in cleaning the graveyard. Then afterwards they started to put candles and then I understand. They them. I understand. What time is it? Uh, not so I got two minutes. So if the question is, how do we take care of graves? The Bible doesn't have a lot of information. Jesus did say a little bit about it. He was talking to the Pharisees. He said, you really make the graves of the martyrs beautiful. But you're imitating the people who killed them. So that gives you some idea. That if you're going to be decorating the graves, make sure you spend more time decorating your character. Make sure you're not imitating the wicked people of the past.
So I asked you to read Romans 1 through 5. And we only started talking about Romans 1. So I'm not going to give you any reading today. But I want you to come back tomorrow able to discuss with me about Romans 2 and 3. That is, reread them carefully. And come back to class ready to discuss. Because it, those chapters say some things about being Jews that most of the world doesn't understand. So we'll start discussing that tomorrow. Alright, let's pray. Our Father in Heaven, we need you to help us to come in harmony with the Bible. I ask for you to do this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.